Notice too, politics, government, and law is the next largest category, and that together for much of the century, those two categories make up more than 50% of the surviving output as recorded in the English short title catalog. This, methinks, ought to make us reconsider how we do book history. Because if you look at the papers given a chart from year to year, about 50% of them, at least, are on literary topics. Hmm. But literature is not nearly so big as some of these other categories. Take politics, government, and law for a moment, if you would. These graphs seem complicated at first, but they're actually very simple. Here we have the raw number of publications, and this graph will help us understand what those numbers are. And here we have the percentage of the total. What's the percent that they make up? The total output for that year. Remember, we're only talking about surviving output. My own calculations from looking at advertisements and printers' ledgers suggest that at least 10% of the printed record across the board is missing for the 18th century, not in the ESC. At least 10%. Why is it that we continually use the tool without ever calibrating that tool, without ever understanding the tolerances of that tool, and therefore the kind of certainty that we can make about the statements that we, you know, are trying to come up with when we employ that tool? Seems to be a major methodological problem in contemporary bibliographical studies right now. But note this. Here, we're humming along, if we do a linear regression here, we see it runs just about perfectly through 25%. And yet, the number of books triples, more than triples, from slightly less than 400 to over 1,200. It triples to stay the same. A nice example to bear in mind when we're thinking about the explosion of print culture in the 18th century. This is medicine, mathematics, and science, and we go from about 2% of the output here to about 7%, and um, this represents about 50 books here, 60 books per annum that goes down a little bit. This represents here, if you see, about 220 books per annum, 50 to 220 every year, and I've checked this data against a number of the other years to see if it's not just a cohort effect. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the argument. Medicine and science go from 50 titles to 220 titles per year. Every year, something radical is happening. Look what's happening to business and finance. Plugging along here, not very interestingly, it seems to me, and all of a sudden, it begins to take off. Well, right when it's taking off in these later decades here, these last five decades, what's happening? Banking reform, change in risk conveyance and insurance, changes in the way that bills of exchange are being handled both nationally and locally, the rise of entrepreneurship in the UK because of changes in financial infrastructure and concomitantly changes in physical infrastructure. So, for example, a lot of the titles in here have to do with um, proposals for building canals and um, making ad hoc share corporations to fund just such public projects or physical infrastructure that will then feed what we might very loosely call the Industrial Revolution, an overused term. That 16% here in business and finance ends up being the 16% in religion, philosophy, and ethics. So at the end of the century, in 93, I don't know 
the number of publications. And again, we can't overemphasize the, you know, the reliability of the data. This is not apodictic in any way. Is this it's more than coincidence? You can run a number of regression analyses and see how good the data is, and it's not bad. But it's not perfect. But what's interesting here is that we see that religion and philosophy of ethi and ethics clearly has a downward trend, something we saw in the bar graph as well. I mentioned the study of literature as a staple of book history. And you think of the 18th century as being that time, most of us anyway, when the novel was invented. You think about the code, Richardson, Fielding, Stern, and so on, Molly. Um, look at this. That's 0.05%, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. For the first five decades of the 18th century, fiction makes up 0.05% of the annual output. Hmm. It begins to go up, of course, until it reaches an astonishing high of about 3.5. Yeah? 3.4? Something like that? So it's pretty low. It, it, never goes, it never goes very high at all. And I think that's important to bear in mind that Sometimes our sensibilities are skewed by the kind of books that we look, look at. Now, fiction as a percentage of literature, too, is very low indeed, all through here, and then begins to take off and achieve greater prominence. So, uh, somebody like James Raven's excellent book, Judging New Wealth, would help to explain how fiction was marketed to the popular uh, public in order to achieve that kind of prominence. But the numbers are still low, low, low. And we might think of fiction, therefore, as a kind of luxury commodity, which has a very high price structure. Right. Uh, like I said, we think of the 18th century as the age of the invention of the novel, right? So, so, but, but, you know, if you do that, right? If you think of it as the age of the invention of the novel, everybody survives the novel, the rise of the novel. It's, it's the dominant thing in, in a lot of people writing about book history. But it's 0.5%. So that seems to me at least a salutary corrective to how do we think about the national printed output? How do we think about the book market more generally? It's all well and good to dwell on the Minerva Press, and those studies have been very beneficial to us. But it's not the only thing in town and it never lasts. I think that may be helpful. This is entirely wrong. This is completely science that do not trust this. Okay? Why? Education and children's books. Ah. Uh, 4%? No. Why? Because anybody who studies survival rates at all knows that educational and children's books have the worst survival rate of all. So that this data cannot be trusted in any way. If we look at the actor's ledger, we know that Dice's Guide to the English Tongue, over a period of 16 years, had 33 editions, and we know what the count is because we have the printer's ledger, a mere 270,000 books in those 16 years, five books in three editions throughout. Five books in three editions are in the ESP. Okay, and really, Three books are in the ESPC because only three editions are represented. Does everybody understand that? If we look at Holman Truppen's um, publisher of children's books in the 18th century, we know that about 75% of the titles that he published in the 18th century don't exist in a single 